they they prefer not to uh, uh, to to be used by ECA, then just email me afterwards, and Simon and I uh, will respond to that. I hope that that's a reasonable way forward. So I I have uh, started the recording. Um, so just just a few words of welcome uh, from me uh, to this uh, ECA Edu seminar uh, uh, webinar. Sorry, one of a, a of an ongoing series. Uh, my name is uh, Julian Park and I chair the uh, the ECA board uh, and today we we have a, a, a webinar with two presenters so it, this is a, a, an exciting uh, double header and talking about uh, the uh, about the exciting topic around uh, AI uh, that, that many of us have been grappling with over the last couple of years uh, but particularly in terms of preparing uh, students for this essentially new and developing era going forward. So firstly, uh, we'll hear from Marco uh, Kluge-Jikaric, uh, who is uh, providing uh, the perspective from uh, a former student's point of view. Uh, uh, and he's graduated with a master's in plant sciences in uh, 2023 uh, from uh, the University of Zagreb. And then we'll hear from uh, uh, Serge uh, Lugovic, uh, who is uh, both a professor at Zagreb, uh, but he's also a business entrepreneur and the owner of, of a business, which he'll say something about it in, in a few minutes. So uh, we really look forward to he hearing what you say. Uh, I think the speakers are going to speak for 15 or 20 minutes each, and then we'll take questions uh, to, to both of them uh, at the end of the session. But what I would encourage you to do is while uh, uh, Marco and Serge are speaking, if the questions are kind of bubbling in your head, uh, maybe just type them into the chat and that will help uh, in terms of uh, bringing those questions uh, to, to, to the fore uh, uh, at the end. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, Marco, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to you to, to share the screen and we really look forward uh, to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you, Julian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, I will share my screen in a second. So, uh, the topic of today's webinar is uh, preparing students for the AI era. Oh, sorry. Preparing students for the AI era. And I will give my perspective as a former student who recently graduated in uh, 2023. And uh, I will explain uh, what uh, my experience is with artificial intelligence, uh, what my experience was during uh, my official studies, and then later on after I started working. So I think the first thing that needs to be discussed is uh, the definition of AI, because artificial intelligence is uh, often used as an umbrella term in uh, everyday conversation. But in terms of specific definition, uh, it refers to the ability of machines to simulate human intelligence. Now, this is uh, most often associated with uh, computer science and programming because uh, it includes things like machine learning and uh, decision trees. If someone has any experience with uh, programming, then you will be familiar with the if-then function. It also includes things like uh, machine self-improvement and uh, predictive models. Uh, so that's the strict definition, but now we come to the question of what exactly is categorized as a AI technology, because if we were talking about some uh, predictive models, then uh, what about Excel? What about uh, statistical programs? Because uh, I graduated in the field of uh, genetics and uh, plant, breeding. plant breeding. This also includes uh, statistics. You know, when you're working with uh, big populations, you have to use statistics. So what exactly counts as AI technology when uh, we're discussing this. <clears throat> now, uh, it's important to explain to any beginners, someone who hasn't used AI before, that artificial intelligence is not a replacement for real people. Chatbots are not replacements for real writers. When you're using a chatbot, the text that's generated might look convincing, it might look like it was written by a real human, but it's not guaranteed to be factually correct or truthful because chatbots cannot recognize the difference between truthful information and false information. Why is that? That is because the chatbots have dependence on data. This means that if a bot pulls information from the internet, it will pull the information that's the most common, regardless of if it's truthful or not. 
with this in mind, all current AI tools, including chatbots and all other programs that are included under the definition of artificial intelligence, they are all counted under narrow intelligence. This means that they are best used for specific tasks because they do not have ability to reason like humans could. Uh, I have some examples of uh, using AI for specific texts. So we'll get to that later. Now, uh, some common examples of uh, AI in everyday life would include things like the Google search engine, recommended videos on YouTube and uh, other video sites, recommended news on your feed, ad placement, targeted advertising, voice assistants like Siri, Alexa, face recognition. Now, some of these count as full AI, while others just use AI, AI elements in their functions. Uh, now we're getting to my uh, personal perspective as a former student. So during my formal education, I didn't have uh, any classes, any programs uh, that uh, covered artificial intelligence, which means that I had very limited uh, exposure to AI during my student's life. And uh, all the info that I uh, collected about AI, that was all self-taught. So I used the internet to gather all information about artificial intelligence. The closest that we ever got during my official education was using statistical analysis software. But that's very rudimentary and a very limited uh, example. Uh, now, with this in mind, I got to the challenge of learning about the use of uh, chatbots and the other AI tools after I uh, got employed and after I started working. So what were some of the challenges that uh, I personally experienced? I had to learn about uh, the capabilities and the limitations of AI tools. What were the AI tools uh, able to do? What were they not able to do? I had to get familiar with the proper use of uh, ChatGPT. It's the most commonly used tool. We also use it in our work to a certain extent. So I had to learn how to apply the info about artificial intelligence in order to use ChatGPT in the most effective way. Uh, I had to know when I got a response from ChatGPT, how to recognize true information, how to recognize false information. And I had to learn all of this on the job. So, you know, uh, while I was working, I had to learn about that in parallel. I had to learn uh, how to give the correct input. This is very important. So you have to structure your uh, question in the proper way to get the best response. Uh, and you have to provide a clear context so that the chatbot can provide the answer that you are actually looking for. Now. Here's an example of a false AI info. So I just took a screenshot, Google AI, smoking while pregnant. Doctors recommend smoking two or three cigarettes per day during pregnancy. Now, I don't think I need to explain why this is false info. I'm just giving an, an example about you have to be careful when using AI because you have to uh, check the information yourself. You can't just rely on the answer to be correct. So. How exactly are we using AI? Uh, how exactly do I use AI after I got employed? So I already mentioned chatbot programs. Now, they help us with some internet searches, but uh, they are not a total uh, replacement. They help us with uh, writing. They help us with the uh, literature review for our research. They help us with uh, text editing. So for example, me personally, I don't have the creative uh, spark, so to speak. So I can use uh, the chatbot program to kind of help me generate a few different uh, versions of a sentence. And then I can either combine them together or I can choose the one that I think is best. Uh, we also have uh, some limited use of AI within Excel. This is something that I mentioned earlier that Excel does use some AI elements in its programming. Uh, and we also use it uh, for automation of uh, some uh, repetitive tasks. Now, some basic features of AI in Excel include things like autofill, recommended charts, uh, data analysis suggestions, formula bots, extraction of data from outside pictures, and some built-in uh, functions or third-party fu functions which you can install as, install as uh, extensions. 
So in my perspective, in my experience, what would be my advice for using AI tools if I was uh, giving advice to beginners? I would say that like all uh, tools, you have to know the, intern the intended purpose. You have to choose the right tool based on the required tasks because chatbots are not good at uh, calculation and math and vice versa, math bots are not good at generating text. And instead of just using a single program, consider more specialized to tools. So you got chat GPT, but you also have scholar GPT, consensus, data analyst, size space, et cetera. Uh, you have to create proper context through a conversation with chatbots. This is an advantage that uh, chatbots have over uh, a basic Google search, because you can ask one, uh, one question, the chatbot will give you the answer, but then you can ask a follow-up question to clarify if needed or to get uh, more info. Uh, now, since I graduated from uh, the faculty of uh, agronomy, um, I gave some examples of uh, using artificial intelligence in agriculture. Now, the most common example is image analysis. So you got pictures of fields, but you can use thermal cameras, you can use uh, imaging software to analyze uh, the soil, the plants, etc. You can uh, apply some geographical information systems. You can use it for precise mapping, enhanced uh, statistical analysis, crop management, soil management, and also artificial intelligence is used for uh, automated uh, climate control in uh, greenhouses. Now, it, it's becoming more, more and more common in today's world that uh, these different functions are getting integrated and they are uh, starting to get used together in order to increase yield and uh, get uh, the optimal outcome. So, uh, I got some examples of uh, how we used AI, specifically ChatGPT, for research, for example. So, I got a PDF document of uh, a research paper and I uploaded it into the chatbot and I asked it to write the explanation of the environmental footprint from the paper. And it gave me a brief overview about, about uh, what environmental footprint means and what's included in the environmental uh, footprint. And it also gave me a short conclusion. So this is just a basic overview. It helps you when uh, reading the paper to focus on uh, what, what are the most uh, important aspects within the paper. So second example, I asked the chatbot to generate a citation for the paper. But as you can see, I provided a direct uh, DOI link, but the chat was not able to give me uh, access because uh, it cannot access external websites. So I did something else. Instead of uh, attaching the direct link, I asked the chatbot for a definition of a certain test. This is a statistical test. The details are not important. Uh, I had to use this statistical test uh, uh, for, uh, for my research paper. So I had to write a citation uh, about the paper where, where this uh, statistical method was first described. So I asked the test to, uh, to give me the definition. And then when it gave me the definition, uh, I asked the chatbot uh, what's the best way to cite the paper. And in this way, I was able to get the citation that I needed. Fourth example is another analysis, statistical analysis method, uh, analysis of variance. Uh, so again, details are not important. I just asked, does it count as an AI tool? So it does not count as an AI tool. Why? Because it's just a statistical method. It lacks a learning component and uh, it uh, does not have the ability uh, of decision-making. However, if a tool is able to recognize outliers in the statistical analysis and exclude them from the analysis, does that count as an AI tool? And the answer is yes, because it includes machine learning and it includes autonomous decision-making. So these are just uh, some examples of uh, me using a chatbot uh, for help with uh, research and with uh, some analysis programs. So what would be my takeaways uh, sort of as a conclusion? AI is becoming a more common tool. It's here to stick around and it will become more common as time passes. So in terms of academic education, if, uh, 
if information about artificial intelligence is included into academic education programs, uh, I think it would increase the student's readiness for later use after graduating. I think the focus should be on the background and the underlying mechanism about how these programs function. And I think that the students should learn about uh, certain groups and categories of AI tools because a specific knowledge about program A or program B isn't very helpful. Why? Because the, these programs change very, very quickly and they replace each other very, very quickly. So it's better to learn about the underlying function and about the different groups of AI tools, <coughs> and the best use for each group of these tools. So that's it for me. I will now uh, give the word to my employer and uh, he will touch on how we use AI tools in our work in more detail and what would be the required skills for our company in terms of uh, future employees and what's the best way to prepare students for the future job market. Thank you very much. Marco, thank you uh, very much. That's a really uh, nice overview and we, we lead in very nicely to what Sergio is uh, going to say. I, I just repeat uh, to, to colleagues that are listening, uh, you know, if you think of any questions uh, while uh, Marco or now when uh, Sergio is going to speak, then please just type them into the chat and we'll come back uh, to, to that at the end. Uh, so uh, and we'll, 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 we'll take the questions when Sergio is finished speaking. So Sergio, over to you. Uh, you're you're muted, muted, Sergey. Second, yes, That's it. we've got you. Yeah, super. And I coming there. Yeah. So, hello to everybody. As a mic, I would like to say super presentation from Marco's side because he showed into some very important point. And from my perspective, just to give the background, I'm holding the master degree in finance and banking. MBA, my MBA was how internet impact the business organizations. We went public in London 2000, back in the days. And my PhD about, uh, is in information science, in uh, quantifying information behavior based on the search pattern. So tell me what you search, I will tell you who you are. And uh, so. And actually, out of that, I come to the business of Vesela Motica, or in it could be in the future name VM Vitamins and Minerals. So we all know that interdependencies of vitamins and minerals. So I think there is a lot of potential in the near future working on new algorithms and actually how to make the best of the their synergies. Uh, I prepared a quite short presentation and I think it follows what Marco liked to say. First uh, point is demystification of AI and then small problem versus weak problems. <laughs> weak problems, this is the common name where the problems are very complex and large. And then I would like to separate tools, technologies and solutions and actually a little bit touch the base where the science and technology and the business meet. But let me open with this slide. I just found it on the one block. Here you could see kind of there is always the maps of technologies. And here is just the map AI in education. I'm quite a long in, quite a long in my life between the technology and the business. I used to, I'm SAP consultant, by the way. So I'm really into the complex information system. And I was also teaching the topics related to the technology. So we always have, I remember maybe 2010 when the digital marketing tools come out, actually the map like this had maybe 100 uh, applications. Now it's more than 3000. So we have to understand that with the, I will say, chat GPT just open up the new area of human computer interaction. This is nothing else for me personally than that. We, in information science, we have something which is called information retrieval, 
which means actually how system propose the data and how we interact with the system information system user. So if we compare the Google and Chat GPT, they're doing the same, just Chat GPT doing it much better. So let's let's try to do the demystification. First of all, Herbert Simon which is the one pioneer in AI, he wanted to call it mathematical reasoning. And he told that actually that this was the one of his biggest mistake that he didn't, when they were about to give the name in the 60s, is that we will be artificial intelligence or mathematical reasoning. And I agree with him that this is mathematical reasoning because artificial intelligence is something maybe too abstract and i will say as we know in science especially life science which is really about to be numbers and be precise and repeatable we really don't have to use such a wide analogy so in a way it's uh, involves creating system capable of performing tasks that typically require human intelligence but here we have the questions who designed them how and why Okay, so for example, if we talk about Chat GPT, we know we are now currently in the kind of geopolitical situation, and then Chinese are behind the uh, Chat GPT. They they have also their their capital and uh, human resources in it. So I think, okay, this is very let's say large scale problem which we could address, but we always have to understand who designed the system how them design and why. So we could work with such a system because human is still perfect semantic machine, this, which is the mentioned Floridi, he's professor of information science from Oxford, one of the leading information scientists. And it's always about, here we have problem solving and machine-based reasoning. So we do the some calculations which could help us to do the some clever conclusion, you know? But still, human is the one who gives the context and who process this data semantically. For example, a few years ago, no, it was almost 10 years ago, I was I was a keynote speaker on the one conference. And they asked me, what do you think about AI? I say, look, while the business uh, the bank trans cost of the bank transaction online is larger and more expensive than liter, of uh, cow milk both from the farmers i'm i am for ai because our system is not working and this is always in vesela motica one of the key fundamentals what we are trying to deal when i say food system is not working everybody asks why very simple technology is cheaper food is worse and more expensive so this is we have all ai we have all investment in technology but actually we are eating uh, worse food more expensive and uh, we throw it more away and then very important thing ai is about the data so we always have to say you as a professors or we as a businesses or we all together as a researchers is data which data we have and how we cuddle with them. This is always, I say, you have to cuddle with data to come out what they are speaking to you. Because without cuddling with them, you know, you will don't come anywhere. And as Marco say, I will not uh, repeat it here. It's the interdisciplinary nature, computer science, statistics, and mathematics. So my message after this slide to all professors, to all people involved in education will be please teach the students statistics and mathematics okay because computer scientists they develop the code based on the statistical method and mathematical uh, foundations okay so this will be my part on try to demystificate it then in the other side here i give the one we have small problems versus weak problems so small problem is plant genetics it's very super easy. You have the Marco explained me quite well. You have good data sets. You match the plants. You actually do the kind of recommendation, which is you have thousands of algorithms like this to download it uh, from R as R script or Python script. So actually here is somewhere where really 
AI could help. Or even planning what to uh, what what type of the plant you have to sow or, and when to harvest. So actually, instead of doing hundred experiments in the field, you could reduce it to the ten. For this, AI, let's call it like this, is super tool. But on the other side, we have big problems on the or let's say large problems. Okay. Here we have the currently we have big Green Deal EU strategy, farm to market, everything perfect. And how the strategy finished? We have farmers on the 13, 13 countries are on the street. They're closing small farms and still they're selling plastics uh, in the super shop. So for me, this is the large problems. Okay. But how somebody, how AI, this big thing which is in front of us, actually how could help us to solve this problem? No way. Because if they will have the tools to sort it, we will not have farmers on the street. And here I will also reference back to Herbert Simon when he says in, in his uh, uh, one book, uh, we, we are not looking for satisfactory output. We are looking for optimal output. And unfortunately, our culture is still on the part of the part of the satisfactory. Okay, uh, let's do something which satisfies us and let's move on. But this is not enough because if you multiply satisfied uh, outputs, you know, output of this function could be completely bad. And uh, maybe you know it's something what is called bifurcation and it could be really... Uh, uh, really, um, how to say, important part uh, part of this. So, okay, we could use the, and here we come to the next slide, actually, where I want to separate it, tools, technology, and the solution. So if it's, let's say, AIs are tools, but they are small tools, generic design inside of data, but we need effective solution. So, for example, if we want to sort out the problems of the farmers on the street, you know, then I'm not sure how small closed AI tools could help us. What we need to do, if we want to develop the solution, we have to have custom development. So essential for aligning AI capabilities with specific needs, ensuring comprehensive problem solving. Because just to let you know, all the AI, okay, maybe it's closer to my, but probably maybe some of the uh, listeners know about the expert system. Expert systems was the, let's say, boxes or the computers. We were loaded with the data very specific, in the very specific domain, you know, and then out of those data in those domain, we could help, uh, we could we used to get the help in 80s, it was in the 80s, how to actually make the decisions, you know. So then we hear, we, we have the, uh, I will like to say, I will like to add that actually challenges with commercial AI tools are enormous because they are usually in the black box and we have the limits of the customization. So I'm coming again back to the topic uh, of this presentation. It's all about learning the statistics and mathematics or some kind of packages such as R, Python or something. So we could understand the problem and could actually give the answers to this. And just for a last slide, and here I will uh, finish it is the, actually where the science and technology and business meet. We need to have holistic education. So we have to combine science technology to prepare the students. And to do this, I really, uh, I'm really motivated. I really like project-based learning. So give the students real world problem because they will then understand why I'm doing it. I have two kids, the one now is in, uh, uh, university, the second is mid school, we always have the same problem. When I show to my son why the math is important, how to make money, he starts to like it. But if he just need to do the, some basic algebra, he don't like it. Also, we need to have understand ethical awareness. In one of my paper, I wrote the following. 
data could restructure by themselves. This is the first stage. Data or information system could then de deploy new functions to calculate, but actually act upon system. So actually make decision or any actions toward the environment should be proved by human. And we also have to understand that at our side in the business, we have to have entrepreneurial mindset. You know, so actually students or everybody involved in the process, professors, students or entrepreneurs should have to understand that actually entrepreneurship is not a bad thing. This is something what we have here in Croatia, because I just had the discussion maybe a few months ago with the one very high profile person from the scientific community. And she told me that applied science is not a science. OK, but I don't believe in that because, uh, you know, what is science if you could not be applied, you know, so this is the very and if it could be applied, if it's applied in the commercial sector, of course, when you need to have to make the some profit to employ people and further research. And the last thing very important is that actually it's not the something one off, but this is the lifelong learning. And here I would like to point to the very concept of friend of mine who wrote. It's called be a digital convergence, which actually speaking about bridging life science biotechnology and information science. Because, for example, if you look the you say, uh, Christina, that it's the problem on the field now. But if you look on the controlled environment agriculture, you have to understand biotech. You have to understand physics about the lights, about the airflow, about the temperature. So it's the physics. But also you have to have understand information science, how you learn from the, those data, how you collect those data and everything. So I really, really like this biodigital convergence as a kind of new concept in the academic discourse, which we could uh, uh, actually use it much better than AI tools. So I will stop here and I hope that I'm on time. Dejay, thank you. That was a, a, a really uh, interesting and thought provoking uh, overview you've given us. Um, okay. I'd I'd like I I've posted a couple of questions, uh, but uh, I'd I'd much prefer it if if other colleagues uh, that have listened uh, to the two presentations want want to come in and ask any questions. So, if you want to uh, either just put your camera on or uh, raise your uh, raise your hand, uh, and uh, we we'll we'll see where we get to. As I say, I hope I don't have to use my questions. I hope some others do come in and ask some questions. So, uh, over to the floor, please. Here we are. Uh, Christina, uh, I, I don't know whether that's a question. Do you want to come in and uh, and ask that oh. question, please? Yes, yes. I was just typing in when you said, yeah. Uh, so my question is for uh, Sergey, actually. So I recently read that uh, since AI relies on human input and we use AI uh, more and more, so that input will decrease and AI will not be as efficient. There is a possibility for that, but what do you think? Is okay. that going to happen? Have, in in information science, we have in information system, we have garbage in, garbage out. The more garbage we put in the system, we will get the garbage. So if we talk, this is when I talk about the data. This is the first thing. But the second thing, it's even more important. I think this is misleading because data, data could be now collected digitally. So, for example, I will not say they are just the people make the solution. So this is the solution technology tool. So you are now in the field. OK, you have to design solution to solve your research questions, challenges or whatever. Then you need to find technology. For example, you have one technology which is actually about the air quality and second one about the soil quality. OK. So you need to combine the data from those two and you need to look for the tools. So actually those uh, data are collected uh, by the machines, not by the human, but human design it. So this is what I say, and this is a really beautiful uh, saying from Professor Floridi, human is perfect semantic machine. So you make the sense of 
data problems. And actually, in my PhD in information science, everything starts with the information need. And this is very challenging because the information need is in our head. So we just start to now to use EEG, phenomenology, and other effective computing tools to see what is in your head. So, and then if you have information need, you look how to collect this data using the tools. So I'm not sure if it answered this your question directly, but I will not be afraid that more data will generate the Worcester system, I think, oppositely. Because, uh, for example, chat GPT, I following open AI from to when it's open, they were just collecting the data, you know? So it's the process. I will not go into the, I finished on MIT big data in 2050, but you have the process of clearing data. So this is the reason you have to cuddle the data and those data put to use to yourself. So this is similar what Marco said, true and the false. So it's try to filter what is entering the system of AI or something. Okay, so, thank you, Sergey. That's a comprehensive uh, answer to uh, Christina's question. Uh, any other colleagues want to come in uh, with questions? Well, I'll give people a, a second just to think. Uh, Marco, can I? Can I come to you and and and, and I, I'm intrigued, um, you know, how much how much time you spend in your job, if you can give us kind of a proportion of time, whether it's kind of five percent or 50 percent where you would turn to AI as part of your kind of working day, if you like. Uh, if we're talking about uh, an average number, I would say roughly 15 percent of the time. Uh, of one, course, there were is that one five. Uh, I'm sorry, one five, one or... five. That's right. Yes, 15. Um, so, of course, there were hiccups when I started working because I had to learn how to use AI since I didn't have any uh, previous knowledge. So I had to learn how to use AI first. But uh, after I was finished with learning how to use AI, I can say that in terms of internet searches, uh, finding uh, relevant information, uh, writing text, because I mentioned that I like the creative spark. I'm not good at writing sentences which sound very intriguing, right? Uh, all of these processes became much, much faster for me after I started using AI for help. Not as a replacement, this is important. It did not replace my work. It just helped me to uh, do that work faster. OK, OK. And then maybe a follow up question. Uh, you know, you said that AI or you weren't using AI during your master's studies in plant science. I just wondered if you if you kind of I mean, one of the challenges, many of us are tutors and lecturers and professors on the call. I think one of the challenges we face is is uh, you know students using AI uh, maybe in terms of assessments? Um, mm -hmm. uh, if if you could cast your mind back, wh where where do you think AI would have been most useful to you in your studies, and would you have used it? Uh, yes, so uh, I would have used it, but like I mentioned, uh, AI is a tool. And you have to use it like all other tools. You have to know what the appropriate use for the tool is. So help with writing a text, yes. Writing a text instead of you, no. So that's one example. Another example, if, for example, you have, you're doing a statistical analysis of a population that has 1,000 individuals, okay? And you're looking for a specific value. And let's say 98% of the values are between 10 and 20. And then you got 2% of the values, which are like 70, 80. Before, I would have to manually go through all 1,000 individuals and find the outliers myself. Now, with the use of AI, if it's calibrated properly and uh, if it's used in the correct way, 
it, had, it can help you to identify the outliers and uh, remove them from your analysis. So okay, that's yeah. One yep. Yeah. And I think I've uh, probably used it in a similar way, right? Um, yeah. Uh, Sergio, you wanted to come in with a response or a question? Yeah, yeah. I, I will try to make it fun, you know, from the, your question. Not, not fun of your question, but to present it interestingly, because as we say, everything come at the end to pay. So as lost of you professors here, you know about the Turnitin system. So about the check, about the plagiarism and everything. Probably a lot of you use it on the university. So maybe 10 years ago, we start to use artificial intelligence to check uh, seminars. Students didn't know that. But now actually we we saved the some times there. Now when the, those technologies are available to the students, we really just need to we just need to little bit change uh, how we teach. Because I think still uh, I will just give you example from the music industry from my friends. So they start to say, "Why wow, AI music blah blah blah." I say, "Okay, let's ten of us." do five tracks each using AI tools. So we have 50 tracks and ask people which one is the best. They will not be similar, you know? So actually it's what Marco say, it's tool and the system. So we have to be aware that it is there for students, you know? So a little bit tween, even uh, try to engage together with them, you know, and the results will be calm. But again, it, the AI GPT is new Google. So this is my point of view. The more important are real uh, mathematical and statistical procedures in terms of machine learning and developing it into the solution. So I will stop here. No, thank you. That's uh, that's clear. Uh, Marco, you wanted to come back in? Uh, yes, I just wanted to follow up on uh, what Sergey was saying because we were talking with uh, Christina before during uh, preparation for this webinar. And she mentioned that uh, students are increasingly using uh, chat GPT more and more uh, to write seminars or other tasks that they have during education. And uh, currently it's the wild west because there are no rules, you know. However, there is something called uh, anti GPT already, which, uh, which is a tool that can check if chat GPT was used to write text, but even this anti-GPT tool isn't uh, fully 100% uh, precise. It can also make mistakes. So I think uh, you can't stop students from using chat GPT. They're going to use it. There's no, there's no way around that. The best thing that you can do is explain to students what are the capabilities of chat GPT, what are the limitations of chat GPT. Uh, explain different groups of artificial intelligence programs. So you have chatbots, that's one group. You can maybe have mathematical programs, statistical programs, etc., etc. So divide them, divide them into different groups, explain the capabilities and the limitations of each one so the students will know what's the best way to use them. Because if they know the best way to use them, then it will just be a tool uh, like, for example, grammar checking, you know, I'm pretty sure Microsoft Word has grammar checking already integrated uh, into it. Uh, sure. Yeah. So chat GPT, same thing, right? Use it as a tool, explain to students, OK, look, we know you're going to use it, but please check the text, you know, go through the text yourself um use it use it to help you but don't use it to write the entire text instead of you and actually for example i didn't use this as, as an example in uh during my presentation but the title for this webinar i actually used chat gpt to help me uh create the title but i didn't i didn't choose the first answer it gave me I provided context about what this webinar is about, what's the topic of the webinar. Uh, I asked it to give me 20 different uh, titles. And then I combined those titles to kind of create- a Come up with the right one. Right. That's good. Thank you. And on the basis of what you said, Marco, I'm just gonna throw a question out uh, to the audience in, in terms of anybody that wants to, come in that, that 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 is is it 
essentially in their courses explaining to students how they could effectively use uh, 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 generative AI uh, in their assessments. Is any is anybody doing that or talking through with students how they use that successfully? Uh, if they are, maybe they could come in and uh, and just say a few words about what they're doing uh, to to explain to students or or what how how they're working with students on that uh, on on that on that particular issue. I suspect there may be silence, but I thought it might be worth asking in case there's some good practice we could spread. Uh, Christina. Um, yeah, um, while we wait, somebody for your question, which I think is really good to to um, ask. Um, when I was listening to, to Marco's responses, um, one thing come into my mind. Uh, Marco, you said you had to learn AI, but how did you some skill sets. I know Sergei said ma mathematics and statistics, but um, did you get some skill sets that make that easier? How was the process? Was it very intensive and uh, it took too much time? Or um, it was a trial and error. Uh, now, luckily, because I already have um, a lot of experience with um, traditional research methods. I was able to kind of rely on those uh, while I was still learning how to use AI. But, you know, little by little, because I could always go back to traditional methods it if it was necessary. But then, okay, I ask uh, GPT a question. It give me, gives me an answer. It's not a very good answer. Uh, but you can ask a follow-up question. That's actually, actually a very, very big advantage of chatbots when compared to a basic Google search, right? If you type something into a Google search, you can't, you can't uh, open another tab and give a follow-up uh, question, right? You, the Google will only give you the results for what, uh, what you typed into, into the search bar. However, if you're using chat GPT, you can ask a question one, it will give you an answer, but for example, you need more data or something uh, specific. So you can give a follow up. You can call back to something that you already asked uh, before. And then during its second answer, uh, the chatbot will take into account uh, the information that it already gave you. It will uh, implement your new question and then it will give you a better answer, an answer that is uh, more refined more re and uh, more uh, specific to what you actually asked. Michael. You're I, I don't think anybody's going to come online, Christina, but thank you for, for asking the question and thanks for the uh, the answer, Marco. Um, given the time, I'm going to uh, draw to a close. I'm going to say a big thank you to, to Marco and Sergey. I think it's helped to advance uh, our thinking in relation to AI in education, but also uh, I think raise some questions or some further questions and thinking that we need to do around this topic. Uh, and to that end, I think that fits in well, uh, hopefully, with the, the slide uh, that, that you can see. Uh, our next webinar in September will also be uh, on this topic, uh, which leads into the um, uh, to the uh, to the board meeting we have in uh, sorry, the workshop we have in Zagreb uh, on the 23rd and 24th of October. So uh, that will be a, a both a physical uh, and, and an online meeting. But so I hope you can join us in September for the webinar. And uh, I hope some of you will also join us uh, for the workshop uh, in in October. So on that note, I'm going to call the meeting to, to an end. Uh, thank you very much again, Sergio and Marco, uh, uh, and to those that have asked questions and much appreciated it. And thank you also to the audience for joining us. A recording will be available uh, shortly and we hope you join us in September. So thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for including us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.